Miyako Kawakami is already a superstar author in her native Japan, a philosophical and feminist powerhouse of prose, interwoven with discussions on birth, death, womanhood, change, and growth. She is now a rising star in the English language too, thanks to works like Ms. Ice Sandwich, translated by Louise Hyokawai and published by Pushkin Press, and now Breasts and Eggs, translated by Sam Bett and David Boyd and published by Picador. In its original Japanese publication, Breasts and Eggs was a novella. This expanded version, split into book one and book two, and translated into English by Sam Bett and David Boyd, is about three times longer, with book two being twice the length of book one. In book one, we see the world through the eyes of Natsuko, a 30-year-old woman living alone in a Tokyo apartment and spending all of her free time desperately trying to become an author. The story follows a weekend visit from her older sister Makiko, who brings along her young teenage daughter Midoriko. Makiko's main reason for visiting Tokyo from Osaka isn't really to see her sister, so much as it is to consult a plastic surgeon about breast enhancements. Midoriko has, for several months now, been entirely mute around her mother, writing her notes if she has to communicate, and otherwise writing in her journal, much of which we get to read, and reportedly behaving completely ordinarily when she's at school. The dichotomy between Makiko and her daughter is the crux of book one, both in terms of story and theme. Breasts and Eggs couldn't be a more clear and direct name for this book given the fact that Makiko spends all of her time and, and is willing to spend all of her money on her own breasts, trying to make them more aesthetic and more desirable, at least by her own definition. Meanwhile, Midoriko's journal betrays her, her rage and her anxiety at the concept of womanhood, the biology of womanhood, and how it defines the modern woman. Midoriko scrawls with white-hot aggression about menstruation, breast growth, and childbearing, sperm, eggs, sex, procreation, all of these things trigger in her a reaction of disgust and hatred, and this hate has spilled out, leaving her literally speechless in the face of her mother's obsession with breast enhancements. Midoriko doesn't understand gender roles and why biology controls us, or rather, she understands it perfectly well, and yet she feels such hatred towards it. She will not be controlled by her biology, and the fact that she cannot control it in turn, such as stopping her breasts from growing or her periods from happening. It's crushing for her. As a reader who is progressively identifying with and adhering to their own gender less and less, this resonated with me in a loud and powerful way. The flip side of this is, of course, Makiko. She wishes for her dark nipples to be pinker, and her small breasts to be larger. She brings up several times the fact that she had a child as the reason for her physical imperfections. She is searching for an ideal of feminine beauty as she's about to turn 40. She is stuck in a job in which she is sexualized and put on display. And this lifelong position has had an almost degenerative effect on her psyche, which, in turn, has affected her increasingly angry and rebellious daughter. Amidst all of this is Natsuko, a woman who watches it all unfold from a place of relative calm and quiet. Natsuko is well-defined in her own right, but far less aggressively compelling as her sister and niece are, which is an asset to the success of this story. Natsuko is grounded, though quietly sorrowful in her own way. She is a window into this world for us, but by no means a blank slate. At 130 pages, book one of Breasts and Eggs is a punk and angry scream in the face of gender politics and beauty standards. It is at once a broad and expansive examination of gender roles and a kick to the guts at a silent yet oppressive system that tears women down and turns them against themselves. Book two is a very different beast. 
measuring in at twice the length of book one, and slowing its pace to reflect its protagonist's age and her own pace and tone in life. If book one was a photograph or a haiku, book two is a film or a sonnet. We still follow Natsuko, but almost a decade has passed, and now at last, she is a published author. Natsuko still lives in Tokyo, is still in touch with her sister and niece, though they exist only at the periphery this time around. And she has finally found herself where she wants to be, paid to read and to write full time. Natsuko is far from satisfied, however. There is a slow, creeping need that is slowly closing in on her, the need to have a child of her own. Natsuko has no desire for a man, she has no real sexual desires, and this is explored in intimate and curious ways in the book. And yet she has this feeling that a child exists in her timeline. She simply has yet to meet them. She must find a way to reach the child that she knows will eventually exist. And so she explores the option of artificial insemination. This is the driving force of the book's narrative. In her quest, she meets a handful of unique characters and also experiences a morphing of her current relationships, most notably that which she shares with her literary agent. Book two's pace is less deliberate and more ponderous, with Natsuko making very little progress with her writing and even less progress in her search for her child. There's a lot more breathing space here, with entire chapters made up of quiet conversations with people like Aizawa, a man who has been searching for his birth father for years. Rika, a single mother and fellow author who acts as a kind of mentor and personal inspiration of sorts for Natsuko. Sangawa, Natsuko's friend and agent. Yuriko, a woman who believes that forcing a child to be born is an act of cruelty, that nobody asks to be born, and therefore it is torturous and unfair. The cast of characters which Natsuko surrounds herself with here work like bumper cars for Natsuko to ricochet off. Despite the crawling pace of book two, Natsuko nevertheless exists in a hurricane, occasionally knocked by an experience or a, or a conversation shared by Rika, Sengawa, or Aizawa. Even though she is about to turn 40, Natsuko is still growing, changing, and learning. She meets death, suffers loss, finds herself floating and confused. She seeks help, finds it, feels betrayed, learns, loses, finds, falls, stands up again. In an interview with Hitomi Yoshio for Wasafiri magazine, Kawakami talks about her philosophical approach to life and death, how she couldn't bring herself to sing happy birthday as a child because I couldn't get my head around the idea of celebrating birthdays when we were becoming one year closer to death and saying goodbye to our loved ones. This philosophical thinking, especially about the road from birth to death, certainly comes out in Breasts and Eggs. Most aggressively and vividly, it's seen in the words of Yuriko, a character who exists almost as a philosophical plot device, obsessed as she is with the idea that giving birth is an unforgivable, cruel act. Yuriko's philosophy is similar to that of real-world philosopher David Benatar, an anti-natalist who believes that since life is so difficult and painful, we should not force our children to have to go through it themselves. Not every character in Breasts and Eggs is so directly philosophical, however. For most characters, it's their actions, and the way in which their words and behaviours affect Natsuko which drives the plot. Both Rika and Aizawa inspire and encourage Natsuko to consider, reconsider, and re-reconsider her approach to giving birth, raising a child, writing fiction, and simply how she looks at the passage of life and time. In book one, Natsuko took on the role of the observer, with her sister and her niece taking centre stage. In book two, Natsuko is very much our protagonist. But even still, she is being battered about by her experiences and by the people who surround her. She moves from phone call to meeting, to dinner date, to phone call, always in conversation with someone, rarely alone unless she's on her way to meet someone. 
This means we are always being offered a new perspective on life, motherhood, womanhood, work ethics, success, and more. This is without a doubt the greatest thematic strength of Breast and X. Perspectives on womanhood and motherhood. Mieko Kawakami explored womanhood in a visceral and angry way with book one of Breasts and Eggs. Book two, on the other hand, offers us multiple stances, opinions, and ideas when it comes to carrying, giving birth, and raising a child, as well as the role of a woman in the family, in society, in the house. Kawakami understands and expresses here that there is no one way to be a woman, no right way to live, no good or bad. That being a woman, a feminist, a mother, means doing things your way, unrestrained, with a view to feeling happy, contented, fulfilled. And she demonstrates this through the multiple and multifaceted lives of her characters. So Breasts and Eggs is two books in one, each one considering and exploring womanhood and motherhood from a variety of perspectives. Book one is a punk and angry wolf howl, an attack on patriarchal standards and restrictions, on femininity, beauty, and womanhood. Book two is a slower, calmer, layered conversation about the power of womanhood, her rights and her roles and her choices and her actions. It offers no one answer, but instead asks us to consider the idea that being a woman means being yourself, 